Welcome, everybody. Welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us today. My name is Gabrielle Swaby. I am a researcher in the climate change group here at the International Institute for Environment and Development. IID is an independent research organization that aims to deliver positive change on a global scale. I lead IIED's work in supporting least developed countries in developing long-term climate strategies. And more broadly, myself and my team, we support the least developed countries group in the UN climate negotiations and with climate diplomacy and so forth. It is my pleasure to be moderating this webinar today, which is part of IID's series exploring the experiences of LDCs and the Paris Agreement as we move from international commitments to national implementation. This webinar is the second in the series, the first focused on how LDCs are implementing the Paris Agreement's enhanced transparency framework. And the recording for that is available on IID's YouTube channel. So definitely go check that out. The next webinar in the series is being hosted in partnership with the Bangladesh-based International Center for Climate Change and Development, ICAD, and will examine the issue of loss and damage specifically around the research and policy and lived experiences of loss and damage in LDCs. This will take place on Tuesday, 8th of September, and we hope you all will be able to join us for that as well. All the details and how to register can be found on IID's website. And at this point, I'd also welcome our panelists to turn on their cameras as well, should you want. Uh, and uh, while you do that, just a quick uh, background we all know are aware that the Paris Agreement is moving into its implementation phase. And uh, an important part of that is that countries have been invited to communicate long-term low greenhouse gas development strategies, long-term strategies. And these are visionary plans to achieve low carbon climate resilient development by mid-century. Now, the Paris Agreement is not prescriptive on what a long-term strategy should look like. So countries must determine what suits them best, both in terms of the content as well as the process for developing the long-term strategy. It's unchart uncharted territory, to be sure. And it poses unique challenges for all countries and especially least developed countries. Now the world's 47 LDCs represent 1 billion of the world's poorest people across Africa, Asia Pacific and the Caribbean. With their negligible emissions profile, the LDCs have contributed the least to climate change, but do suffer the most from its impacts. And indeed, this would have important implications for LDCs and their long-term strategies. We have seen some long-term strategies come forward already, and most of them submitted thus far are from major and emerging economies, largely focused on decarbonization, and rightly so, of course. Uh, LDC's long-term strategies must also consider though future growth and expansion and development aspirations in a sustainable way. Even more, their goals and plans for enhancing adaptive, adaptive capacity, strengthening resilience and reducing vulnerability will be featured just as prominently. So it's safe to say then that the LDC experience in implementing and developing a long-term strategy deserves unique focus. And I'm pleased that we're joined today by a wonderful panel of LDC and LTS practitioners currently in the process of developing or supporting the development of long-term strategies. And they're here today to share their experiences. We hope the conversation today will not only showcase the unique opportunities coming out of the process for LDCs, but to facilitate as, facilitate as well a dialogue among LDC practitioners on the common challenges and concerns they face in the process. Uh, we have almost 140 participants who have signed on to join. And as Juliet mentioned, I ask those who are present with us today to participate by raising your questions. We want to hear from you. With that, let me introduce our panelists. Uh, we have Bubakar Zaidi Jallo, Margaret Bariai, Serene Yangzom and Siddharth Pathak. Bubakar is the Principal Climate Change Officer for the Ministry of Environment, Climate Change and Natural Resources in the Gambia. He's just getting settled there. Uh, and he's responsible for environment and climate change related issues, working with the UNFCCC and the GEF focal points 
And of course, most importantly, he coordinates the development of Gambia's long-term strategy. Margaret uh, is also here with us today. She's based in Uganda as the Regional Manager for Anglophone Africa with the NDC Partnership Support Unit. Margaret supports Anglophone Africa countries and Mozambique to access technical and financial resources to achieve their national targets towards implementing the Paris Agreement. Uh, we also have with us Sering. She is a Senior Environment Officer with the Climate Change Division of the National Environment Commission Secretariat in the Royal Kingdom of Bhutan. Bhutan also chairs the LDC group in the UNFCCC, so a special welcome there. Uh, and uh, Sering is responsible for adaptation projects such as Bhutan's long-term strategy, but also their National Adaptation Plan Readiness Project, their Urban Ecosystem-Based Adaptation Project, and so on. And finally, but certainly not least, we have with us today Siddharth, who is the Director of Partnerships at the 2050 Pathways Platform which is a multi-stakeholder initiative to support countries seeking to develop their long-term climate resilient sustainable development pathways. He oversees the relationship of the platform with its members as well as prospective partners and supports them in developing that 2050 strategy. A hearty welcome to Bubakar, Margaret, Sering and Siddharth. Thank you for joining us today. Now, to get started, I'll do a quick, simple question to our panelists. In one word, just one word alone, what would be the ultimate outcome or gain you expect a long-term strategy to help your country achieve? And I'll start with Bubakar on that. What's your one word? Sustainability. All right, very yeah. good. A nice all rounder. Uh, and then Margaret, how about you? Yeah, thank you, Gabriel. Uh, I greet my fellow uh, panelists and the viewers. Uh, the word for Uganda, which could be an ultimate outcome for the LOTS, is harmonization. Oh, I like it. Very special. Okay. Uh, Sering, how about you? Thank you, Gabriel. Uh, and uh, hi to everyone. Um, for Bhutan, it will be carbon neutrality to sum up it. Carbon neutrality. Two words, but I'll give you a pass on that one. <laughs> And then Siddharth, not, although you're working uh, with countries across the board, I suppose, not particularly one. So in general, what do you think long-term strategies would be achieving? Preparedness. Preparedness, okay. Well, I want to delve into a lot of these words right now. Uh, so maybe I'll go back to Bubakar and picking up on your word of sustainability. Could you maybe tell us where the Gambia is in the design of its long-term strategy? And can you already tell us if its focus is going to be addressing sort of that broader sustainability agenda of tying in both uh, climate action as well as development priorities? Bubakar, over to you. Um, good afternoon, fellow panelists and um, all participants. Um, as Gabriela said, my name is Bubakar Jalo from The Gambia. Um, well, The Gambia so far, I think we've been making good progress with regards to the development of our LTS. We've been working with IID for well over a year. Um, we've had a scoping mission. They visited the country. We had a workshop which sort of introduced the concept of having a long-term strategy. What would it entail to a very wide range of stakeholders, both government and public, as well as private and academic, uh, the academia. We also had um, earlier this year the visioning workshop, which I think also went well, where we had, I think, more than 45, almost 40, 50 participants from the cross-sector participants, from the public sector, private sector, uh, but all of them um, are either impacted by climate change or have an impact on climate change, either meaning that they would need to adapt or they are, or they are contributing to greenhouse gas emissions. So I think it really has helped because it's sort of focused. The Gambia has had a lot of strategies since 1992. We've had a national climate change committee. We've done a national communication similar to the other countries, I'm sure. But a lot of times you have policies or institutions working, having their own initiatives with regards to climate change, but they are not all speaking to each other. I think with regards to the long-term strategy, what we believe that it will help us do is not really to develop new strategies or institutional arrangements or policies per se, but rather to help us consolidate what we have. And Margaret uh, said it very well, uh, harmonization. I mean, harmonization of policy. I would have used that word, but you already said it. So harmonization is a very good um, way because a lot of times our policies don't speak to each, to each other. You have one institution doing one thing that is going against the other one, or you have um, duplication of efforts. 
So, I mean, so far, we've also had our stakeholder consultation, although it's been a bit restricted due to the impact of COVID-19, but we've managed to do it virtually for the past two weeks at the national level so far. And we're hoping that if things improve, we can uh, move to the regional level. With regards to the um, how broad our LTS is going to be, obviously, as um, Gabriela said in the introduction, LDCs are not responsible for greenhouse gas, the concentration, high concentration of greenhouse gas emissions with the atmosphere. Obviously, we do contribute to it, even though it's a minimal amount. But therefore, I mean, whatever long-term strategy we have should reflect our situation. This is a, it's not a one-size-fits-all. Everybody has their own situation. What might be relevant for Nepal might not be relevant for the Ghana. So, or what might be relevant for Germany might not be relevant for Uganda. So I think we need to really look at ourselves in terms of our mitigation. Of course, we'll still mitigate. In fact, our NDC, the one we submitted in 2015, was heavily uh, mitigation-centric, but that was just to send out a political statement to bigger countries that if we small countries who are not responsible are trying to work towards mitigating climate change, then the bigger countries should take a bigger, should be more ambitious than we are. So basically, um, that's where we are, and that's the approach which we're taking towards uh, developing ideas. Thank you. Thanks so much, Bubakar. Lots of rich insights there, and we'll be teasing apart some of those a little bit later on as we get further into the discussion. But you segued nicely into Margaret and her work with the harmonization. And so I'll use this opportunity to go to Margaret and ask her, uh, why is it important for Uganda to be delivering on this voluntary commitment? And in what ways do you think, in what ways has the process already started to bring harmonization uh, throughout the country? Uh, hand over to you on that. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, maybe I should say that what I will be sharing now on Uganda's LTS process is uh, preliminary discussions but which are really basing on what is already existing. And you are going to see how the country is trying to see that harmonization is key for them to look at long-term planning. So the process has just started. It's being supported by NDC uh, partnership with Germany funding, and they are implementing it through the GIZ Global Carbon uh, Markets uh, East African program. It's going to take nine months. So the motivation I see in Uganda so far, the discussions why LTS is very important and, and urgent is because uh, they are using it now as an opportunity to look at elaborating their climate change adaptation long-term goal. The government has been trying to develop this uh, because it's its priority. Uh, since 2017, they've been trying to develop their NAP, but it hasn't kicked off. So government is like, let's take this opportunity, define our long-term adaptation goal, which will in the future be, uh, mean, be uh, used to drop their nap. So that's one thing. And you can imagine Uganda contributes only 0.099% on the total global emissions. So even in the current NDC priority is a, is, a, is a, I mean, adaptation is a priority, but it's not well defined. So that's one motivation I see Uganda taking on LTS. Another thing that really is major for Uganda in the discussions, Uganda is looking at its economic growth cannot happen without climate action. And this is because the economy basically relies on uh, natural resources. For example, 70% of the population relies on agriculture. And 90% of the energy uh, supply, energy needs, depends on uh, biomass. And this is charcoal and fuel. And currently, the government is already aware that the natural resource base is actually worrying because the recent studies inform government that the forest cover is really gone. Because like between 2010 to 2017, in six years span, the government lost more than half of the forest cover from 15 percent to 9.5 percent so this means at this rate the government is looking at being more vulnerable because the land degradation the rate is high it will be more vulnerable to climate variability and change so this is one of the motivation the government is looking at long-term planning is key and already in 2019, just last year, a study is showing government that under business as usual, the affordable sector will be the most emitting sector. And yet this is where the economy is, is, is relying. 
So government is looking at having a balance between adaptation and mitigation in long term to have the clear targets to, to, for 2050 and for both adaptation and mitigation. And I don't, I should not forget that Uganda is already doing long-term planning. So it's not the first time that Uganda is looking at long-term planning. It have it has a 2040 vision. So the LOTS is building on the existing structures and the governance of, on how Uganda went into 2040 planning. And the good news is that the 2040 uh, vision is already promoting climate resilience, low carbon and green economy. So for Uganda, it's about harmonizing and taking uh, adaptation forward in balance with uh, mitigation, looking at co-benefits and promote them. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. Uh, very interesting to hear all the action plans and commendable indeed that and very strategic thinking to have this LTS be the foreshadowing for es essentially a long term adaptation goal in the country. Uh, now, you also mentioned that Uganda is not starting from scratch, that you have significant building blocks upon which to uh, further advance. And I think it's a similar situation in Bhutan. And so maybe I'll uh, head over to Sering as well. And in, with your word of carbon neutrality, uh, indeed, uh, car I think Bhutan right now is one of the very few carbon neutral countries in the world and is heralded for its exemplary, exemplary long-term planning. Uh, so as Bhutan starts its preparation, can you share with us some insights and some of the building blocks already in place, which will be taken up in the LTS development and implementation process? Uh, thank you, Gabriel. Uh, yes, I agree. Bhutan is gearing towards a very unique LTS development because many, while many other countries are trying to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions through their LTS, um, we have already achieved that target and more so Bhutan has already made this ambitious target by committing to remain carbon neutral for all times to come in December 2009. So, we are carbon negative at the moment, but maintaining this carbon neutrality for all times to come is definitely going to be a challenge for us. Therefore, maintaining this carbon neutrality is going to be the focus of our upcoming LTS. And also being a very small, landlocked, least developed country with very fragile mountain ecosystem and with limited capacity and resources, building resilience is very critical in the LTS. And there are already some studies and modeling conducted on Bhutan's carbon neutral status. One of them is economic wide effect of carbon neutrality on Bhutanese economy, determining the implication of decoupling GHG emissions from our economic growth. And the other ones are also looking at Bhutan's carbon neutrality towards 2050 with scenario projections of what would happen if we go by business as usual scenario or if we have precautionary measures in place. So also following up on the carbon neutral commitment in 2009, we have already prepared the national strategy and action plan for low carbon development in 2012. And that will guide us to uh, remain committed to our carbon neutrality. And therefore the LTS, the LTS under preparation can take reference to all of this strategy and action plan for low carbon development and other policies. And there are also many other assessments that are conducted through other ongoing projects like NDC, the National Adaptation Plan, and low emission development strategies. So therefore, the current L uh, LTS with backcasting and scenario creation with economic, socioeconomic modeling, it can give us the opportunity to have a very holistic view. I think it can tell us about where we are, what needs to be done, how to strategize, what can be done better, and what sort of technologies are required for Bhutan, and how can we add value to what we have. So we are looking forward to all these answers from the LTS. Therefore, this LTS is definitely going to be visioning for the country at the right time. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Sering. And indeed, lots of rich materials to work from and loving the aspirations of ensuring decoupling uh, growth from climate uh, from GHG emissions. Uh, and so maybe I'll go over to Siddharth. You've heard all these words, sustainability, harmonization, carbon neutrality, and even years of preparedness. 
And I was wondering, could you speak to more generally, how does aiming for net zero fit into the equation as a catalyst to achieve all these aspirations? And what have you been seeing across the board from these countries you've been helping to support with their long-term strategies? Sure, thanks, Gabriel. And I think a lot has been said by all these plan all the panelists who are obviously working at their country level. And I can probably give a more macro sort of a, uh, uh, an understanding of how different countries are approaching it. Uh, just to sort of give a bit of a background, around 17 countries have already submitted their long-term strategies. Uh, we are expecting over 60 countries, more than more 60, more than 60 countries to actually submit their long-term strategies by COP. 26 next year uh, and they will be of different sizes and shapes so it's not just the emerging economies it's just the g20 are sort of going to be the front runners in terms of submissions but i think there are a lot many countries who are submitting it uh, and are preparing for it uh, i think one the moment you start talking about long-term strategy in the context of climate change you sort of tend to talk about a lot of the words around green growth sustainability uh, harmonization with existing climate policies. Uh, but when we've actually worked with a lot of countries, what ends up happening is as soon as you start uh, talking about climate change, the inevitability of climate change, whether it's uh, whether we'll be able to, as a community, as a whole world, be able to mitigate climate change or whether we'll be able to sort of deal with climate change, we will, there is an inevitability to it. And that will create two sort of separate streams of things. One is the, the sort of opportunities that emerge from climate change mitigation and the risks that will emerge because of runaway climate change, that will happen. Um, and the long-term strategy quickly becomes a tool to prepare for these risks and for managing these opportunities. Uh, whether it's opportunities in new sectors like renewable energy, whether it's opportunities in new materials uh, for battery technology and for different technologies, whether it's about uh, sort of showcasing your intent as a country that we'd like more investments, we'd like more green investments, and thus we want to have sort of a plan uh, that, that needs to be presented to the world. On the risk side, uh, there's obviously the geophysical risk that a lot of LDCs are very well prepared for. In a, in a relative sense, they've done a lot of planning and have a history of planning around adaptation. But there are also risks around standard infrastructure. There are risks uh, related to fiscal risk uh, and there are jobs uh, which are at risk uh, because we are not prepared for the sort of economy that will emerge um, uh, in a in a climate in a in a climate change world um, so the long term strategy is generally the starting point is obviously climate change paris agreement but as soon as the countries start to discuss and start to unpack it it quickly becomes a rather sort of um, broader and macro exercise to understand how climate change impacts different uh, sectors and different areas, uh, as well as the different aspirations around development and economic growth of the country, and how the country can actually prepare itself for these sort of emerging opportunities and risks. Uh, and the long term strategy ends up becoming a tool of that. The carbon neutrality element, obviously, LDCs uh, and AOCs are front runners uh, or well champions, uh, if I was to put it like that. Uh, on this issue, and like uh, Sering also said, uh, Bhutan is already carbon negative. So a lot of countries in the LDCs and AOCs have very limited carbon footprint. They're already doing quite a lot. Um, but the idea is that if we are to imagine a country or our economic development in the future, we will have no choice but to imagine it in a carbon or a net zero world. If we're imagining our country or our economic growth in a world which is even uh, carbon positive in any sort of way, I think that's something that we are sort of impacting the entire community in the entire world. So the approach on the long-term strategy has to start off with imagining your country in a carbon neutral world. Some countries have a head start like Bhutan who have already imagined themselves in a sort of a carbon neutral world. But I think there are a lot of other countries that need to think about uh, carbon neutrality and what that really means. Uh, for their aspirations, whether it's development aspirations or uh, economic growth aspirations um, in the particular country. So that's how I would sort of probably characterize the idea of carbon neutrality uh, in long-term strategy as a quite a central pillar, uh, which, which needs to be uh, the anchor point for the imagination of the future. Very well said. 
uh, and indeed that sort of ultimate vision of uh, thinking backwards from carbon neutrality is definitely a key aspect of that. And, uh, so then uh, I want to go back to then the country perspective as well. In thinking through then how this, it's a massive undertaking to be fair, uh, thinking through all of this. And I was wondering back to our panelists, if you could share with us maybe an unexpected opportunity, maybe something that Siddharth has already mentioned, or even an unexpected challenge that has emerged for, uh, for you in undertaking this process so far. Uh, so either an opportunity or a challenge. Uh, maybe I'll start with Bubakar as well. Um, thank you very much. Um, I think uh, I'll talk about opportunities, surprising opportunities. I mean, it, one opportunity was that it helped us to align some of our, or at least we're in the process of trying to align all our climate change related strategic documents with the National Development Plan. I think the idea was when discussing from the Dambes core team when working with IID is to have a long-term vision and have a long-term goal, both adaptation mitigation. It's not yet um, decided, but at least that's the concept. And then to also factor in the political cycle, because you have to remember that leaders change every five, four years, depending on where you are. But the idea is that we don't change the goal, but maybe we just review and update on how we get there. We, through the, through the process. So I think this is one thing that it's helped us to also align it to the current uh, national development plan. Another opportunity I think which um, Siddharth mentioned was the renewable energy. It's a real opportunity for us to look at because we have a lot of plans, um, national renewable energy um, plans under the Ministry of Energy, Energy um, Efficiency Act plans, etc. But it's, it's an opportunity to, to align all of them and also an opportunity to give renewable energy a chance. And Gambia is already having some projects, regional projects, such as the um, River Gambia Basin project, which is using hydroelectric um, from Guinea Conakry and Guinea Bissau, and Gambia is benefiting from it. So we're already expecting some form of um, RE, but this is an opportunity, I think, to make it, um, to expand it even even further. Um, another opportunity is also, um, sorry, um, mainstreaming of um, climate change into, um, because we always say that we've made, find the National Development Plan has climate change mainstream to some extent as a critical enabler, which is recognized. But now having working with the sectors, especially during this consultation state, we've had very detailed questionnaires, which are really asking them very key questions about their sectors. Where do they, where do they see their sector in 2050, 2046? What mechanisms or, or pathways do they want to take to get there? So it's improving their understanding of actually what it, the climate change uh, regime is, global regime, and its reflection on national level is, is all about because most of the time stakeholders just come to workshops, you give them a couple of presentations. They think about it superficially, but it doesn't really sink in very deeply with regards to how does this relate to what I do, example, as a transport planning officer or as a agricultural planning officer. But now with this LTS process, we have a very good core technical team, which has now been met, we've been working since um, the scoping mission. And during this consultation stage, it's really come out very clearly um, having gone through the questionnaires, very detailed questionnaires, looking at where we are currently, where we want to be in 2050, and which pathways we want to get there, just to simplify it in those three questions. So I think this has been a great opportunity to sort of further sensitize and also look to identify opportunities of mainstreaming climate change into um, all the sectoral plans as well. Thank you. Thanks, Bubakar, and very much appreciate the honesty there in terms of how stakeholder consultations have their own form of business as usual and trying to make it hit, hit home and integrating that more mainstream approach is definitely one to uh, pursue. So thank you for that. Uh, Margaret, how about over to you? What's an unexpected challenge or opportunity that's come up? Yeah, I think I will also share maybe um, an op opportunities uh, because uh, in the initial discussions in Uganda, because I mean the discussions may change, but I see a very good opportunity because the discussions now on LOTS from their inception report, I see them thinking about like uh, getting to economy-wide approach uh, because um, their initial, the first NDC for Uganda was sort of NDC approach. I mean, uh, sectoral, sectoral approach. But I see now the LOD, uh, the LOTS discussion is bringing in other sectors like tourism, like ICT, like uh, education, 
which were not uh, in relation to the climate action debate or discussions. So this is really great for, for Uganda to see, and I see the discussions of LOTS informing the NDC updating, uh, and I can see the government is taking the opportunity of aligning both processes of NDC updating and LOTS, except that the NDC updating is starting, is starting a bit earlier, so the arrangement may not be 100%, but I see one of the things which I can score now, I see government, government making one national task force that will handle both processes together. So that means they are looking at the discussions to benefit from each other. And I suspect the LOTS will definitely inform 100% the next NDC, that is after 2025. So that's successive. I, I, that is what I can see as an um, unexpected opportunity. The another one is what I had mentioned earlier on how a government is taking advantage to get their adaptation, uh, adaptation targets upfront and clearly uh, bringing it. So basically this is what, oh, maybe I should also mention that in the discussions of LTS, I see government wanting to first of all get a long-term vision for LTS come out clearly. And this is very interesting. I think this is where now harmonization will come because government already has a vision 2020 in terms of development. But if they can now look at the climate action long term, there is going to be some harmonization and, and, and the two will be starting to, to speak together. Yeah, so basically that's what I can share because Uganda is still in preliminary discussions. Thank you. Excellent, thank you. And yes, even the fact that those discussions are happening with tourism and education and ICTs is already putting the country on a good track, I think, to have that whole of society, whole of government approach. Uh, and then uh, over to you, Sering. How about your unexpected opportunity or challenge? Um, well, although Bhutan has just initiated work on LTS development, I foresee that LTS process cannot be different from other ongoing processes that we have. For example, we have just uh, we have submitted first NDC in 2015, and now the second NDC submission preparation is on uh, underway. So I I I foresee that LTS process will be similar to uh, all of this. But one thing that we have done so far through our experiences is. Actually, for the actual implementation or for the actual uh, action phase, doesn't seem to uh, garner much support as compared to the development of policies. I mean, like, in fact, we tend to get a lot of support for the preparation of policies, but we don't seem to get much support for actual implementation of these policies. Um, there are a lot of uh, challenges in attracting investment actually. So, and this has always been one of our drawbacks so far, we, because we Bhutan have a lot of excellent policies, but implementation is still pending. Uh, and you must be wondering why. Again, because as an LDC and with limited capacity and no resources, I think we feel during implementation phase, unless the support provided. So I'm hoping that this will not be the case with the upcoming LTS. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And you've actually perfectly teed up my next question to Siddharth then, uh, seeing that he is working with a lot of development partners and financial institutions. Uh, maybe Siddharth, you could help answer uh, some of these questions and concerns around getting support for the long-term strategy and its implementation. Where is it that LDCs can access this? And uh, what are some, uh, I suppose, tips and tricks uh, to consider in that process? Thanks, Gabriel. I think uh, <clears throat> from, from our perspective, uh, we are working with quite a few uh, development banks as well as uh, with the international development agencies of most of the countries. Uh, and there's a, uh, there's a larger and growing interest in a lot of these institutions to actually look at the long-term strategy as sort of a, sorry, it, it, there's a construction going down right under my house. So apologies for the extra noise. Um, but, uh, but the idea is that uh, for most of the development agencies, they're starting to look at long-term strategies as a, as a central tool 
uh, to actually decide on their investment decisions. And as of now, the development agency for France, uh, 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 the development agency for Germany, uh, and like Margaret said, GIZ. So if your country has AFD, uh, ICI, which is the German sort of development agency, uh, DFID, uh, which is the UK one, uh, GIZ, or, or the European Commission, please do reach out to them and basically say that you're interested in developing a long-term strategy and or sort of engage them much early on in order to address some of the concerns that Sharing mentioned that if you bring the development partners much early on in the process, I think the chances of them being bought into the implementation strategy would be much higher. Another side step to this is to sort of engage a lot of the development banks that are existing in your country and I'm sure uh, World Bank, AFDB, uh, depending on which region or Asia Development Bank, all of them are quite interested in the long-term strategy. So in case you can't necessarily reach out to them, reach out to us and we'll sort of facilitate that. And that's what we're hoping to do with uh, the countries that we're working with uh, that engage the financial institutions much early on in order for them to actually help in financing, not just the development, but also the implementation of the long-term strategy so that it aligns with their sort of existing goals because i think as of now uh, it the the harmonization between financial flows and climate policy never really happened uh, organically uh, but i think with the long term strategies there's an opportunity to uh, harmonize these two as well uh, and actually sort of look at how we can bring these partners much early in the process in order for them to be uh, more participatory uh, for the implementation phase Wonderful. That's excellent and very good tips and tricks all round. Uh, and I will reiterate Siddharth's uh, offer to put you in touch with their uh, contacts as well across the board in these financial institutions. So please do take up the 2050 Pathways platform on that offer uh, should you need it. But very insightful. Uh, and you're, you mentioned that uh, uh, harmonization uh, again, keeps coming up. And I'm going to actually turn to some of our questions from our participants. Thank you so much to those who've turned in their questions. It seems harmonization is a growing thread uh, and a much of much interest. Uh, so Margaret, well done on bringing up that theme for today's uh, webinar. One of the questions from our participants uh, asks, what kind of methods work best to harmonize a wide array of plans? And in what way does this go beyond a technical exercise to result in a lasting harmonization? Uh, and I think that's a very valid question to sort of get into the nuts and bolts of that. Uh, and I think I'd throw that out to all of our uh, panelists. And so maybe I work from the person who started it all, Margaret, with her word. Um, if you could share with us uh, some methods that work best and does it go beyond a technical exercise? Thanks, Margaret. Thank you, thank you. Uh, what you what I like the question from the whoever put it. Uh, I I sh should call it a process, and there is no way I can share a best practice now. And we say harmonization has taken place, but so long as the momentum is set uh, to go together, both development and climate action, then that means harmonization is something we should look at in future. So for example, uh, if a government is looking at developing a long term, an LOTS long term vision, and it's even uh, getting it together, the discussion with their development uh, long term vision, but also who is discussing, who is discussing the harmonization. So let's have a whole of government approach. Let's bring the technical people who can know the, 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 the technical part of it. Let's get the scientists that know what is happening around the climate uh, projections and the, the current and the future. Let's get the politicians, the, the decision makers that are going actually to pass the plan. And then this is something which can happen. I'm giving this example from my own, but I see like other all countries are looking at this so that at the end of the day they can have one harmonized vision of what they want to see in the next 50 years but then remember politically most countries are five year they have this five year political cycle so in these discussions how are they breaking down 
the different milestones at different levels, what can be achieved in short term, mid term, and long term, even if the political cycle changes, let's continue with what has been agreed. So to me, that is how harmonization uh, should be and bringing on board all key economic sectors on board. You can imagine when it, came to, when it comes to climate action, many people always think about energy. You'd see energy being dropped very fast, climate, uh, smart agriculture, but they forget about water. They forget about the disaster risk. They forget about uh, education. They forget about ICT. So they forget about gender, you know? So to me, this is a process. Even the current LTS will be done. It will not be perfect. But the good news, there is going to be some kind of revision and revision as people are working together. So it's about bringing to be, together everyone on board on the same table to plan for the future of the countries. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Margaret. Yes, picking up on those tips and tricks of who is in the room when discussing harmonization, breaking down milestones at different levels, as well as um, yeah, yeah, following that trajectory as well is very important. Uh, and uh, I think maybe I'll pass over to Bupakar as well to see if he has other insights in terms of sharing the different methods to harmonize as well as if it goes beyond a technical ex uh, action. Sorry, technical exercise for you. Um, thank you very much, um, Gabriela. I think um, what Margaret said is extremely important. I mean, without harmonization, we're not going to make a lot of progress. When it comes to policies that have divergent views, I mean, sometimes strategic environmental assessment could be a very useful tool because it looks at where the conflicts are between the various policies. And in the end, it's, since it's going to be a long-term plan, 25, 30 years uh, into the future. It would make sense to try to start regulating because the thing is most of the times we tend to approach these things superficially. We just have a plan that includes everybody, but it doesn't really reflect into the business day-to-day -day activities of all those different sectors. With now, then when we, they come to, they, it's not a priority for them. It's just something that has been sort of imposed. But if we can have um, either strategic environmental assessment, which looks at all the different policies and plans, and then identifies which are in conflict with each other, where are the areas of our potential um, synergy as well, which really, really helps with um, regards to resources and except. I think also an, another approach with the Gambia use is that we've we've um, aligned our LTS directly to our national climate change policy and also to our strategic program on climate resilience, which is a 25-year investment plan that was supported by the World Bank um, Climate Investment Fund. Under this um, policy, we have four various clusters, one of them looking at um, agriculture, land use, etc. The other one looking at energy, we have at um, education, water. So, I mean, Margaret has made a very good point with regards to things being left out because it's easy to just focus climate change, climate change, and then you forget that on the other side of climate change is disaster risk reduction, which is just more, more or less the same thing, just a different name. Um, water, I mean, without water, you can forget about climate change adaptation. So what we've done is to have an integrated approach where all of these are considered. And even um, just during our consultation, this came out very clearly because the water sector have shown us their priorities, um, what their vision is with regards to a long-term strategy. So I think for the strategy to be holistic and for it to be robust, you need to have considerations for all the sectors that are affected or have an impact on climate change. I think I made that statement in my uh, opening uh, remarks, not just who is affected, but also who can affect. So um, I think that's one way of looking at it. Without harmonization, I think there's no point in trying to have a long-term strategy. Thank you. True words that could, yeah, that definitely summarize everything. Uh, and indeed with the Gambia as well, uh, the fact that the Minister of Environment is working in collaboration with the Minister of Finance and Economic Affairs to be developing their long-term strategy is also a part of that and uh, helps with the process. Thanks, Bubakar. Uh, and similarly to uh, Sering, what do you think are some methods for harmonization? Um, well, I agree with my colleagues here. But as far as uh, we are concerned, I think it's harmonization is basically looking at the management process that you have. Uh, for example, if I just give up, I'll come up with our own example. It's like the internal, uh, internal process of aligning 
the uh, the project's objectives with your the guiding uh, development philosophy for example in Bhutan like if you look at LTS that's about aligning LTS uh, objectives with the GNH principles and also with our development the uh, five-year development plans so that um, you have this country ownership and for in case of Bhutan it's being committed through it is very evident through the political commitment for LTS for example uh, because uh, for the LTS, the overall strategy uh, guidance will be provided by NEC, which is National Environment Commission, which is an independent authority and the highest decision making body on all the matters related to environment and its management within the country. And uh, it is actually chaired by the Honorable Prime Minister or any relevant minister which is appointed by the Prime Minister. And this NEC is being supported by a committee called C4. Climate Change Coordination Committee, which is a multi-sectoral multi -sectoral technical coordination committee. And it has a wide representative from different stakeholders to discuss and coordinate matters related to climate change and activity, uh, climate change activities within the country. And it makes recommendations and suggestions to be taken up by the commission. So the uh, Climate Change Coordination Committee actually avoids duplication uh, between different projects because it has various representatives from different sectors and it synergizes between different projects that is already there in the country. So it's looking at the management process, I guess. And secondly, I think it is also really important to look at identifying what should be the kind of input that has to go into a project and also at, uh, framing the desired outcomes. So uh, when you look at identification inputs for the project, it can build on the, the studies or the assessments and outcomes that were uh, uh, conducted through other projects. So that way you can have this harmonization, synchronization with different projects while you are built on, uh, while you build towards building resilience and emission reductions. And if you look at the framing the desired outcomes, if you look at your desired outcomes, then it can align again, like, for example, with all this um, current assessment that Bhutan is conducting, we have seen that climate proofing is one of the major components coming out from different studies. So that's why, like, um, the outcomes are framed like enhancing adaptive capacity. Why? Because we need to protect livelihoods and then achieving and safeguarding food and water security and also enhancing ecosystem structures and functions and also supporting and enhancing human health and safety. So I would basically look at that from three different angles. Thank you. Excellent. Very, very interesting to note. Um, and actually, I want to pick up on your, uh, uh, your thoughts there of having an independent authority that's sort of overseeing all of this. Uh, and maybe, Siddharth, if you don't mind, I will read out the next question and uh, you'll answer the next one, uh, because that independent authority relates to another question from our participants that asks, how does one manage the uh, politics around this and maybe even the competing priorities in, com in aligning development and climate plans and in implementing them, uh, with specific reference now to what's happening in, with the world in terms of the COVID pandemic? How does that competing priority and that politics, um, how, how does one manage all of that throughout this process? And so maybe I'll start with Siddharth uh, and then work our way back and then uh, we'll wrap up after that. Siddharth. Sure, uh, I think uh, on the, so let me start with this. I don't think everything is about harmonization. I think there is a lot that can be harmonized, but there's also a bit of rethink uh, that needs to be part of the larger long-term strategy process. Uh, I think uh, with respect to COVID, you can consider it as a shock. It's not, I don't think anybody could have anticipated it. So you can't be prepared around it. But the idea for the long-term strategy should be about building not just a whole of government, but a whole of society vision that actually agrees on a direction of travel. So I'm not saying that you need to have fleshed out strategy for what exactly will be your climate policy in 2043. What you need to have is that by 2050 or so on, where exactly does the country need to be? Do everybody, including people on the other side of the political spectrum, broadly agree that this is the sort of direction of travel? That's why it's important not just to engage with the government, but to also engage with the society that includes 
individuals, public individuals, but also industries that play a very significant role in how a country will sort of shape up. So I think that if there is through the long-term strategy an agreement on this direction of travel, regardless of what shocks COVID or COVID 2.0 or hopefully not, but whatever comes through, at least countries will continue to have that same direction of travel. And I'll sort of come back to what Sharon said. The political sort of impetus in Bhutan from the top, from the king himself, is to actually support actions on climate change. And that sort of drives, so whatever happens, we will continue to have climate change as a central piece in our sort of direction of travel. So I think it's, it's a matter of getting that as part of the DNA of how the country wants to progress. And the long-term strategy should be considered as a process to get that integration of uh, how, the direction of travel with relation to climate change uh, for the country. So I think it, it's more to do with that dimension uh, for us instead of uh, sort of looking at sort of temporal shocks like COVID and sort of adjusting the entire climate institution itself. Thanks, Siddhar. Uh, yeah, yeah, what I'm picking up there is setting a common direction of challenge, uh, travel across the board and having that directive from the top as part of the DNA in the process uh, can help with overcoming some of these political and competing priority challenges. Uh, maybe I'll hand over to Bubakar to see if uh, what do you think on that and if you have more to add. Yeah, I mean, just to speak on um, is it the uh, impact that COVID has had, for example, um, you mentioned about the issue of shock uh, resilience, etc. I think, uh, like, as Sida tried to say, I mean, this is something that was not, is completely out of the blue. So there's no contingency planning for this. But um, I think one thing which is obvious is that LDCs, by definition, are the least developed country group, and they have low adaptive capacity, low technical capacity, financial capacity with regards to everything, not just climate change. So it's the same way that climate change would um, is affecting us, making us more vulnerable. Is the same way that similarly COVID is impacting us, but although on a very shorter uh, time scale. I think maybe one thing uh, which initially um, when the, the outbreak started. I, think, I remember a lot of people were talking about greenhouse gas emission going down because the excess economic activities are, are less um, deforestation. All these environmental parameters were looking good because um, of lack of human activity. But then now that is starting to backslide, it, especially in our area, because, for example, people who now are not socially active will have to go into the forest to cut, to, you know, carry out illegal timber or charcoal production things like that, communities that live near forest parks that used to have tourists around the year, and that would be a livelihood option for them, do not have this anymore. So it's leading to more and more and more degradation. So um, what we're seeing is, I think what we can try to do is to plan on maybe, like it's difficult to anticipate something like this happening again or knowing the frequency, but at least to have some form of mechanism that can help um, with regards to livelihood, because in my short experience, I've seen that climate change adaptation is livelihood, the livelihood component is very, very important. Infrastructure is important, but in the end, if people don't have um, food to eat and to be able to take care of their families, it, it ex further exacerbates the problem because they then go into the natural resource base and do all sorts of damage just to make things work with the, and they have to, 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 to survive. So I think um, this is something that can be looked at in terms of livelihood support, perhaps in the future. In, with regards to disasters, I think this could be classified uh, as a disaster. Um, no contingency, of course, as, as Siddharth said, but I think um, maybe along looking at the livelihood side, that, that, that is something where maybe we could try to look at mechanisms with regards to how people are supported. Because here in developing countries, it is, is very obvious. Once the agriculture system fails or any form of livelihood system failure occurs, people will go into the natural resources. And this does not help our long-term planning at all. Thank you. Absolutely. When people are at the center and at the heart of a response, that will definitely trump any sort of uh, political uh, ideologies, per se, as long as people are being taken care of at the livelihood and at the household level, for sure. Uh, Sarin, would you like to add to that? Um, well, I think uh, as far as Bhutan is concerned, um, this is nothing new. Um, like get bringing everybody on board because um, given our small population size, it has all, uh, we always conduct this national stakeholder consultations prior to making um, prior to making any major decisions. 
by engaging the whole of society and leaving no one behind. And this is very much supported by, again, the um, GNH principles. And also with the uh, current 13 Fabia plan, it's just focused on, it is focused on just and harmonious society, leaving no one behind. So this way, like, um, again, like, yes, stakeholder consultations are very crucial for LTS development because it can bring on, like everybody said, um, it can bring on board various stakeholders, not just government, but non-government, regional, sub-regional, the civil society organization, private sectors, because we need to ensure that their concerns and priorities are taken on board. Um, but, you know, um, uh, given this uh, current situation from COVID-19, uh, we are just concerned with, uh, um, with the effectiveness of stakeholder consultations, the quality and outcomes of stakeholder consultations, because so far with our experience of developing this second NDC submissions, uh, these were some of our uh, issues. But again, like um, uh, for institution memory and also for effective coordination and also to avoid duplication, in Bhutan, uh, the LTS will engage the same technical working group that has been constituted for national communications, the biennial update report, the national adaptation plan, and other ongoing activities. So that way, we are make, trying to make sure that it is inclusive of everybody's voice on it. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, and as we're just about coming to time, I do want to give Margaret one last chance to uh, maybe share her thoughts. And if in a quick 15 seconds you want to say some parting words, then please do. And then I'll wrap up thereafter. Margaret. Um, yeah, I think I agree with all my colleagues what they have said. Uh, but just to add one thing is that the, the in pandemic, I think, has caused the world to understand that um, one is uh, much as it came to 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 impact health, but you see the results is that it has cross cut all sectors. So this is something which um, which I see that it shouldn't be looked at as a health issue. Then two, it has mobilized all the political will and support we needed for climate action, for example, which we haven't reached, but also the resources huge amounts of money is put in place just to look at health. So that's why if, um, some uh, discussions are already going on to see how best do we bring the, the, the impact of coronavirus uh, across the board and also integrating uh, the climate action in the economic recovery. And this is an initiative already under the NDC partnership and most countries are already accessing economic advisory services to see how do they integrate climate action in the economic recovery as a way forward. But I agree we have to look at long-term uh, planning. Thank you. Absolutely. And wonderful words to end our uh, riveting conversation on. Thank you very much. Thank you to all the panelists uh, for you and the role that you play in supporting LDCs and thinking through what the world needs to get on track to be a more sustainable, inclusive and resilient one for us all. Uh, really appreciate your time. Uh, I want to thank everyone for joining the webinar, our wonderful participants for sharing all those questions and to the team working behind the scenes. Uh, as you can see, we're sharing lots of links uh, for the next upcoming webinar. Uh, we'll also be sharing out the recording of the session, and that should be up on our website very soon. Uh, indeed, the registration for our next uh, webinar is open, and that will be on the 8th of September. Uh, so really hope that you can join us for that. Again, thank you for everybody. And with that, I will close our webinar. Thank you.